just before I start my speech, I want to tell you the sad truth about myself. I don't own camels. <laughs> I don't live in a tent. <laughs> and my dad is not the king of Egypt, although that would be cool. Here we go. As I was growing up, never really, I never really knew what I wanted. I just followed what my parents wanted me to do. They, were, they weren't first forcing much on me. It was just that I couldn't make my own decisions. I tried to make them happy their own way. I tried to do what they wanted, even at school. I used to follow the norm of being a good student in class, following the rules. I was always passive and watched other people lead me to my own path as I was following. I got sick of it, and I wanted to change. I figured that I have to lead myself to my own path if I wanted to do something special. I needed something to work for, but it was hard for me to set a goal. <coughs> that changed after I won the US Open in squash four years ago. Since then, my goal wasn't winning anymore. It was doing whatever it takes to see the pride I saw in my dad's eyes when I won. It was phenomenal. He accompanied me through the whole journey. It was painful, but worth it. I was clueless what was ahead of me. I was just winning one match after the other. I beat the number one seeded player in the third round. Then I beat two of my close friends to reach the final. It was painful. I could barely move my legs. My dad was telling me, I'm proud of you, but just push through this last one. It was a long match, but in the end I prevailed. When I finally won last shot, I immediately turned around and looked at my dad. He stood up, had his arms in the air. I looked in his eyes, and what I saw was unforgettable. I saw pride in his eyes. I enjoyed the moment more than winning. I mean, of course, winning was awesome, but honestly, it didn't matter to me as much. Shortly after, I asked myself, I asked myself, is winning what I really want? I thought about what I want, and I figured that I had to reestablish my goals. But I couldn't really set any goals because a year after, I came to the US. It wasn't an unexpected change of plans. I mean, I worked for it. I worked hard for it. I didn't know whether it was going to work out or not. Or more frankly, I didn't want it to work out because I didn't want to leave where I'm from. While on the other hand, I wanted to work out because I knew it was going to be better for me. I knew that changing everything I, I was used to is what I'm going to help. I knew that changing everything I was used to is what was going to help me lead myself to my own path. I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't even know if I was going to stay here and continue all three years. It happened, and I came here. I figured that I was going to stick around for a while, so I had to reestablish my goals. I wanted to play in the US Open again. I wanted to win it again and repeat the whole story all over, but without my father this time. It didn't work. I lost. Two years later, I wanted to win my last junior tournament, which was again the US Open. I worked hard for it. Not hard enough, but I put in a lot of effort. I lost in the third round. That whole experience taught me a lesson that I will tell you about later. My junior year came along. My family and I decided to focus on my academics and put squash on the side for a little while. I had my college list down. It mainly consisted of top colleges. I contacted the coaches, and all of them told me your grades are fine, but you'll need to work on your SAT a little more. In fact, it was a lot more. They were just being nice. <laughs> I never really felt comfortable with the SAT because it was standardized. I felt it was limiting me. Anyways, long story short, I didn't end up doing well in the SAT, and I didn't get into any of my top choices. That also taught me another lesson, which I'll tell you later. Finally, this is the story that taught me one of the most important lessons in life. I thought I knew how to appreciate things. My parents have always told me to appreciate everything around me, because one day you might wake up and find none of it. I understood what, they, what that meant, seeing on TV how people suffered from poverty and, or, or hard life conditions. However, I've never understood 
I never really understood the real meaning of appreciation until last summer. An Uber driver involuntarily taught me that priceless meaning. I ordered an Uber to take me to the airport. A man in his mid-forties with a foreign accent and a nice comforting smile on his face showed up and helped me with my luggage. We got in the car, and after spending some time on the road saying nothing, the man decided to break the awkward silence by starting a friendly conversation. He asked the common questions of where I'm from, then why I'm, then why I'm in the U.S. I told him that I'm from Egypt, I study in the U.S., and I'm going back home for the summer. The man started to talk about himself. He's originally from Armenia, and he came to the U.S. because he and his family won a greed card lottery seven years ago. He works two jobs to afford his children's education. Moreover, throughout the conversation, the man kept mentioning that life was too expensive, as if he was intentionally reminding me of how tough life is. Going back to me, usually, when it's time to leave the U.S. Or to, get, to go back home or other way around, I feel that I do not want to leave. Sometimes, I rather feel that I want to stay in the U.S., probably because when I'm in the U.S., and when I'm in the States, I'm the one in control of my life. However, I used to have a frown on my face and think, why do I always have to go back and forth, especially now when I spend three, only three months at home, which I don't think is enough. Johnny was his name. He started talking about how he has spent seven years in the U.S. and has not seen his parents. The only reason that kept him from doing, so, from doing so was that it's too expensive for him to buy a ticket. This were, these were the words that made me think. This man has spent seven years without seeing his parents because it's too expensive, and he, has n and he does nothing but work to get money, f got money for living. I relatively do nothing compared to him, and my dad can afford booking a flight every break to see me. The beautiful part was Johnny's smile when he was telling me about his life. It seemed that he accepted the conditions, while when I thought about myself, I still had that lousy frown on my face. Johnny ended his beautiful lesson that he taught me by giving me a pack of gum, followed by no one cares for anyone anymore. Then he helped me with my bags and gave me a firm handshake and told me with a delightful smile, have a safe flight. Here's what I learned from my first story, from my experiences playing squash. Set your goals and don't let, any, don't let someone else set them for you. You're going to fork for them. You're going, f you're, gonna, you're going to find a group of people who will tell you you can. And at the same time, another group of people who will tell you you can't. It's absolutely your choice to prove who is right. More importantly, it's absolutely your choice to prove to yourself whether you can or can't. Always try to prove to yourself that you can because there's nothing you can't do if you work hard enough. Let me tell you something. I almost quit squash multiple times. Every single time, I thought it was going to be the last one, but I always came back. If I surrendered to my poor decisions, I wouldn't have been here, standing before you, giving this speech right now. I wouldn't have been a recruit. I might, I might not be the best, but I'm good at it. It's not your goals that define you. It's the process that you go through in order to achieve your goals that does define you. It's what you do that makes you stand out. The time you spend working on what you want to improve when everyone is else is either sleeping or having fun. It's fine if you don't have, you d if it's fine if you don't have that figured out yet. I'm not done defining myself. I mean, we're still in high school. We still have a lot of goals to achieve and many processes to go through. It's important, it's important to surround yourself with the people who will help you get on your feet after you fall. And on that note, I want to thank you, Mr. Burbank, for being there for me and, help me and helping me get back up whenever I needed to. Yeah, and also Barrett and Gordo sometimes help me. <laughs> help me out every now and then. Here's what I learned from the second story. I'm not blaming the SAT for not being able to reach my goal, although it was close. I didn't work hard enough anyways, but I learned an important lesson though. Life is full of standards that people make to limit others or measure their abilities. The SAT, for example, only measures th certain things, but not everything. If you want to set a goal, set your own standards if that means sometimes breaking away from other people's standards. Don't reach your goal on their terms. Don't follow their path. Make your own trail. Last but not least, 
It's appreciation that I learned from Johnny, the Uber driver. Who thought that I would learn something like that on an Uber, on an Uber ride to the airport? Johnny made me realize how fortunate I am and not regret why I'm leaving, but, uh, but to appreciate the moment and appreciate that I was there. Try to appreciate everything around you. Appreciate what you have. Appreciate what you don't have. Appreciate that you are there and live the moment and appreciate the presence of people in your life. Show them that you do, because time will come and the dearest people to your heart will leave. Finally, when you reach what you've been seeking, if, or even when you're still w working for it, don't forget to give back. Make someone's life better. Help out others. Actually, if it is as simple as drawing a smile on someone's face, because along the way, someone surely did the same to you. Thank you.